All right. Good afternoon, everyone. It is noon. So um, hello and welcome to this month's episode of Manamit's Small Sit Virtual Series, Monitoring and Stewarding River Herring in the Gulf of Maine with Manamit's Emily Farr, Senior Fisheries Program Manager. I'm Erin Sheehan, Digital Marketing Manager, and I'll be your MC for the day. If you're new to Manamet, a little background on our organization. We use science and collaboration to reverse shorebird decline, promote coastal resiliency, and educate and inspire the next generation of conservationists across the Western Hemisphere. If you're a friend, volunteer, trustee, counselor, or donor, then thank you. It's only with your support that we can continue to get our boots muddy, or Sandy, doing hands-on science in collaboration with our local partners. Just a couple of housekeeping tips for today's webinar. First, we would love for all of our attendees to type into the chat where you're all Zooming in from. Um, and after that, we're gonna save the chat for any tech issues that happen um, during the webinar. We welcome your curiosity. So if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box and we'll be happy to answer them at the end of the presentation. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Emily Farr. The floor is yours, Emily. Awesome, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thanks everyone for joining. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. How's that look? Looks great. Awesome, great, thanks. Great, so hi everyone, welcome. Um, my name is Emily Farr, as Erin said, uh, and I'm on our fisheries team at Manomet, and I'm gonna talk about some of our work on river herring uh, in the Gulf of Maine. So for anyone that's not already familiar with our fisheries team and our fisheries work, uh, our focus is really on promoting resilient and productive coastal ecosystems and communities through applied science and community engagement in a changing Gulf of Maine. And that looks like uh, a lot of different things across a lot of different fisheries. And I'm gonna to talk today specifically about river herring, which are up here in the upper right corner, um, the picture here on the slide. So when I'm talking about river herring, I'm talking about two different species, alewives and blueback herring, but I'll just refer to them as river herring throughout the presentation. And they are an anadromous fish, which means that they spend most of their lives out in the ocean and then they migrate up into freshwater ponds and lakes to spawn in the spring and the summer. Um, and so now's the time that they're really coming back into their freshwater habitat, into rivers and streams. The first ones I'm hearing are just starting to show up at the, um, the mouths of some of our rivers here in Maine. And they're already running, I know, down in Massachusetts and further south. Um, so now's sort of a really exciting time of year for these fish. Uh, their range is along the the coast of um, the east coast of the the U.S. from kind of Florida all the way up to Nova Scotia, and they've been really impacted by a lot of different stressors over time. Things like dams that block their migratory um, ability to get into their freshwater habitat, um, pollution largely from sort of historical industrial uses of the river, things like mills and logging, um, as well as overfishing. Um, in you know these mostly in um, saltwater habitat, and these they're still caught incidentally, sort of in some other fisheries out in the ocean. And then climate change also plays a really important role because these fish are using so many different habitats from the ocean estuary all the way up into freshwater throughout their life cycle. They're impacted by different climate stressors, sort of throughout those different um, habitats. So just to give a little bit more background on uh, what sort of river herring migration and life history looks like. So like I said, they're coming, the adults are coming back into coastal rivers every spring to spawn. And then soon after that, they're returning back down river to the sea. The juvenile fish that are born in that freshwater habitat are remain there usually until the summer or fall. And then they also go back out into the estuary. Um, there's been some really interesting recent research looking at a lot of variability in the migration patterns and life history of these fish and their habitat use, um, with a lot of them sort of moving back and forth between the lower river and the estuary for a longer period of time than maybe we would have typically expected. So there's sort of a lot of variation in how they're using these habitats. 
And then we know a lot less about um, what's happening in the ocean about their at sea migration patterns. So um, river herring are range wide uh, at, I believe, up still about 1% of their historic levels. So we've seen a really drastic decrease in the number of fish that are landed or caught and brought to shore in the commercial fishery. Um, this graph here is showing the um, real steep drop off in those landings of fish um, in kind of the late 60s, early 70s. But um, in some parts of the range, um, we've seen with restoration and management action, the population beginning to be restored. So this is a graph from Maine, from the Maine Department of Marine Resources, showing um, the uh, alewife landings in the commercial fishery in the state of Maine. And you can really see this increase in recent years as these populations are starting to come back with a lot of really um, amazing restoration work. And that's from everything from large dam removals to kind of working on providing fish passage at smaller dams, historic dams, um, culverts, things like that, and a lot of really active stewardship in this fishery. Um, and a lot of the rest restoration work in the state of Maine has been really led by um, a lot of partners, but especially the Wabanaki tribes. Um, the Penobscot River Restoration was a huge effort um, that had a lot of leadership by the Penobscot Indian Nation and the Passamaquoddy tribe are real leaders in a lot of the restoration work along the Scudic or St. Croix River um, along the coast with Canada. So I've talked a little bit about what river herring are and what their populations look like um, and some of the work that's happening, but why are we talking about river herring? Why are they important? These fish are prey for pretty much everything. They're eaten by larger fish, birds, mammals, um, and they really are this connective tissue between freshwater, estuarine, and marine environments. They're bringing nutrients back and forth between those ecosystems, and they're really kind of a sign of healthy coastal ecosystem um, ecosystems. And they also are a connection to community. They're sort of a sign of spring. Um, I think of them often as a great poster child for education and outreach around ecosystem health because they're often returning in such large numbers to these streams and rivers. So they're really impressive to see and they can really sort of bring people together around a river. Um, they've been an important food source for Wabanaki people for thousands of years and they are a traditional fishery in Maine. Um, uh, commercial fishery still today. It's one of the few states that still has a commercial fishery and it's sort of collaboratively managed um, between different levels of government and a lot of community members. So um, one of the things that we do at Manomet is co-lead a Gulf of Maine river herring network with our partners um, at the Maine Center for Coastal Fisheries. And this is really an opportunity um, to bring people together to collaborate around these really important fish. There's a lot of people that work on and care about river herring. These runs are occurring in people's backyards. They're stewarded by community members and harvesters. Um, they're managed coastwide at the federal level. They're managed at the state level. And then there's a lot of um, town and community involvement in stewarding the, the runs at the local level. There's lots of researchers, um, tribes, other NGOs, lots of people that are working on these fish. So we started this network about four years ago to really create a space for people to come together, share information, learn from each other, and build um, collaboration and relationships. And it's really sort of founded on this principle that everyone's voice is welcome and respected, and it's a space for people to kind of come together um, in, in, a, in a comfortable way. Um, so like I said, some of the goals of this network are to build relationships and trust, to work on some collaborative research projects, which I'll talk in more detail about, to answer community and harvester questions, as well as um, fill some management gaps and empower members of the network to engage in research, to advance collaborative management and really just build our collective capacity to steward these fish. Um, and then to provide a forum for people to share things that they're learning, ask questions, identify uh, collaborative opportunities. Uh, we have a website for the network just to say it exists. It um, has a ton of information about river herring, different resources, 
different efforts people people are involved in, some data. So if you're interested in sort of learning more, um, check it out. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the community science work that we're doing as part of the River Herring Network. One of the priorities is really has been really to advance collaborative research, like I said, to answer questions that communities and harvesters have, as well as informing some of the management decisions that are happening. Um, so we have a few priorities and things we've really coalesced around as a network. One is really supporting people that are monitoring these fish that are returning um, in the spring. A lot of the time, the way that we get an estimate of the population is by volunteers standing at the stream or at the fishway in the spring with counters like this one that I have in my hand up here in the upper right, counting how many fish are returning um, into the uh, ponds and lakes uh, at certain intervals throughout the day. And then there's been a lot of work around other kinds of monitoring technologies, things like video. Um, and we just had a presentation last week at the network about some work um, using AI to try to figure out um, different ways to monitor these fish. Um, so really we're trying to provide resources for people who are counting and, and pull all this data together. We're also really interested in understanding river herring production. So how many juvenile fish are being born every year and how many are leaving to go back out into the ocean? We also want to understand the factors that are influencing migration and movement patterns of river herring. So I talked a little bit about their variable life history, um, and you know their their movement patterns can vary by stream, by year, depending on the conditions. So we're looking at things like temperature, uh, food availability, um, water flow, and and different things that are impacting the migratory patterns of these fish. And then finally. Um, really trying to better document the role of stewardship in this fishery. We know that community stewards and harvesters are doing a ton of work to maintain these fisheries and these runs. Um, and so we're trying to um, document that information. So um, one of the big things that we've been doing is trying to better monitor temperature at a lot of these runs. We know temperature plays a really important role in river herring movement. They wait until the water warms up a certain amount to come into freshwater habitat in the spring. And we want to get a better understanding of what that relationship looks like and how it varies and how things may or may not shift um, over time. So we have about 30 loggers deployed across different streams in Maine. This is our third year putting these temperature loggers out. Um, and we're adding all of the data that we're collecting to a Northeast stream temperature database, which is here on the left of the slide. Um, really just an open data platform that allows anyone who's doing climate modeling or research of any kind that needs temperature data to have information available across the Northeast um, that they can use in their work. We're also working with a lot of community members um, to support sampling of zooplankton. So zooplankton are the food that river herring are eating when they're in their freshwater lake and pond habitat. And we want to better understand how the availability of food is impacting river herring production and migration patterns. Um, so we're working with communities to uh, do some of this monitoring and then with university partners at uh, Maine Maritime Academy to analyze the information we're collecting with uh, a new piece of technology they have called a flow cam. And then this video here, this screenshot here is um, from a workshop that we hosted last year where um, people built their own nets with nylon stockings and other sort of materials that they had around the house. The idea being really trying to make this kind of data collection accessible and easy for people who are interested in participating and, and also collect useful data at the same time. That's one of the real goals of the network is to try to make this an accessible thing for a lot of people. Um, and you know the, the scientific nets are pretty expensive and people made some pretty great ones with nylon stockings and are collecting some interesting information. So that was sort of a fun um, a fun workshop last year. And then we're also um, trying to do a better job understanding the juvenile fish when they're leaving in the summer and fall to return back into the estuary and ocean. And so collecting information about when they're leaving and how big they are when they leave to inform management. 
We're also trying to really share all of the data that we're collecting and that other that people are collecting and, and kind of want to gather together in an open and accessible way. So this is a platform that we've been working with students at the College of the Atlantic in Maine um, that will pull together count river herring and shad count information from across their range. So all along the East Coast, it's in development right now. So it, we haven't um, published or shared it yet. But it's something that we've heard from a lot of people that they'd love to have a place that they can see what's going on with these fish year to year and just get a sense of how things are changing across different runs. And that isn't a resource that currently um, exists in any comprehensive way. And then um, I talked about, you know, the, the really important role of stewardship in, um, in the river herring fishery and in river herring populations. We know that harvesters and community members are putting countless hours into things like notching or clearing beaver dams, collecting scale samples and other biological data for managers, counting fish, participating in alewife committees, um, and all sorts of other activities. But these aren't really well documented in any comprehensive way. So we have a project that we're really excited about um, kicking off this year that will have some survey and interview work and really try to document the specific nature of all of these activities that people are engaging in so that we can better account for their role in, uh, in the health of river herring runs. Uh, I mentioned Maine is one of the few states that still has a commercial fishery for river herring. And our runs in Maine are in, they're, they're getting better, they're in pretty good shape. Um, and that's not necessarily the case in other parts of the coast. And there's a variety of reasons for that. But we think that harvesters actually play a really important role in the continued health of these runs. In order to get a harvest opened in a town in Maine, they need to have 10 years of data that's showing that the run is healthy and can support harvest. And so that means that people who are interested in harvesting are putting 10 years into counting fish, into making sure they have passage, collecting information um, to share with managers to ensure that their run can meet that criteria for harvest. Um, and often those are the same people who are really working in, in um, restoration of these runs. So um, they're putting a ton of time into this process. And then once harvest is open, harvesters have a responsibility for continuing to collect data and maintain free passage. So stewardship is really kind of hardwired into the fishery. Um, and we've heard anecdotally from several folks in states where they've um, lost harvest that people have started to lose their relationship to these runs. And so there isn't as much care and stewardship that sort of happens from the community um, in some places and some there still is, but it looks a little bit different um, than it does in places where there's still this really strong connection to the fish. So we want to do a better job documenting that relationship and understanding the important role that all these people are playing in the health of these um, fish. So I'll just end by saying that um, a lot of the work that we do is really related to the bigger picture of climate change and kind of the impact that that's having across the Gulf of Maine, whether that be in fisheries or shorebirds or all of the work happening across Manomet. Um, Climate change impacts every life stage of river herring in different ways, things like their movement patterns, whether there's enough water to allow them to enter and leave ponds. Um, and it's why a lot of this monitoring is really important so that we're better prepared to manage and adapt and understand um, in, in changing conditions. So with that, I will stop and I am happy to answer any questions that anyone has. Okay, um, we have a couple questions here. Emily, that was great. Uh, a lot to think about. Um, let's see, from an anonymous uh, attendee, we have, would oyster restoration help in, improve the estuarine environments helping the herring? That's a good question that I don't know if I'm super equipped to answer. I mean, we know oyster restoration has a lot of benefits in terms of water quality and protecting the coast. Um, and generally improving ecosystem health. Um, but I don't know, I, I don't know much about the clear relationship between oyster restoration and herring. Um, I know there was a great small sit from my other fisheries colleagues, Marissa and Jesse, all about their oyster restoration work mm -hmm. in Maine um, a couple of 
months ago, if anyone hasn't seen that. Okay, yep. available on YouTube. <laughs> um, another one, um, what do you use for temperature monitoring equipment? So we have um, Hobo uh, tidbit loggers that are Bluetooth enabled temperature loggers. Um, we have them in kind of these, there was a picture on one of the slides, like these PVC housings mm -hmm. that we can um, secure somewhere and have them in the, in the streams um, throughout the year. I'm not familiar with this term. He specifically asked, is it an L button? I don't know what that means, but. I also am not sure what that means. <laughs> Okay. Um, another one here. How long does an adult herring that has just spawned stay before heading downstream? Good question. And I should off the top of my head have a better answer, but I don't think, I mean, they, they leave pretty soon after they spawn to go back out into the ocean. Um, I believe, I mean, a matter of weeks, but I'm not, I don't have an exact number. Okay. I think it varies, it varies a little bit across different places. All right. And um, once a barrier, like a dam or something, is removed, allowing the herring to come back into the fresh water, roughly, like, how long does that take? Is that a one to two years or up to 10-year process? Um, I think, it, I mean, it depends on the run and the site. In a lot of places, in several places, when there's restoration planned, um, Sometimes there's stocking that happens in the years before restoration. So they're at stocking adult fish in the freshwater habitat that are able to leave. Um, and then once the barrier comes out or there's a fishway put in, um, they're able to kind of recolonize that habitat more quickly because there are fish that they return generally to the habitat that they were born in. So that helps kind of with the um, the process. They River herring are... Um, really, I think one of, they're really great in terms of looking at the impact of restoration because they do return really quickly compared with other species. And you kind of see their population continue to grow after restoration um, kind of year to year. Great. Um, and from Jody, how are the Maine ospreys doing? Um, there are discussions further south about the depletion of Manhattan from overfishing, possibly impacting osprey productivity the past two years, how important are herring in the osprey's diet? Good question. I do not know how the osprey are doing generally. Um, they definitely are eating river herring. Uh, I don't know in what, like what proportion of their diet river herring are. I know there's a lot of interesting kind of diet work that happens, but I have not, um, I have not heard anything specifically about the osprey. So sorry, I don't have a better answer to that question. I will say one of the the ways that people uh, that the, one of the signs that the fish are returning, unsurprisingly, um, to kind of get a sense of when we might start seeing them coming back into uh, the streams and rivers is when you start to see birds um, appearing around the the runs, and you you know they they know better than we do, so that, that's a really good sign um, that the fish are about to come. Mm -hmm. um, does the larger herring harvest reflect the larger population or more active fishermen? Um, definitely reflects the larger population. I mean, there's if there's more fish coming, there's more of an opportunity to harvest. The way that it's managed is um, the harvesters are only harvesting certain days and so taking only a certain portion of the fish that are returning. So as there's more fish that are returning, there's more opportunity to harvest. And there have been um, a few new areas that have opened to harvest in recent years, but not a huge number. It's really kind of reflecting the increased population. Great. Um, so if we don't have any other questions, um, I can wrap it up here, um, but if you'd like more herring in your life this week, uh, we'd love for you to join us this weekend for a complimentary happy hour with Happy Fish at the Plymouth Center for the Arts on Friday at 5 p.m., as well as on Saturday at the Herring Run Festival at the Plymouth Grist Mill from 10 to 3. There'll be food, games, crafts, music, and of course, herring. Um, if you'd like to learn more about Manamet, please visit our website, manamet.org, or join the conversation on our Facebook and Instagram pages. 
Uh, if you enjoyed today, we'd love for you to show our support. We'd love for you to support our work directly with a donation online if you haven't. Next month's webinar will be with Mariana Castellano. Mar Mariana leads Experiencia Ambientalia, an international education program out at our Wisburn sites, Marchiquita, at a Wisburn site in Marchiquita, Argentina, Mono Lake, California, and Great Salt Lake, Utah. This ambitious program, which began in May 2021, aims to generate substantial changes in the Marchiquita wetlands through promotion of young environmental leaders who carry out projects to mitigate threats present in that region. And lastly, if you're itching to get out and do some birding, as always, you're welcome to join us on our first Friday bird walks, the first Friday of every month at the Plymouth headquarters. And now we at the Small Sit are signing off. We'd definitely like to thank Emily for her presentation. Um, and we hope all of you enjoy this spring week um, and have a great day. Thank you.